So now it's my just deep pleasure to uh, introduce tonight's guests. T. Bui was born in Vietnam three months before the end of the Vietnam War and came to the United States in 1978 as part of the Boat People wave of refugees from Southeast Asia. In addition to creating The Best We Could Do, Bui is also the Caldecott Honor winning illustrator of A Different Pond, a picture book by the poet Bao Phi, and uh, T's short comics can be found online at The Nib, Pan America, and Boom California. Bui taught high school in New York City and was a founding teacher of Oakland International High School, the first public high school in California for recent immigrants and English learners. Since 2015, she's been a faculty member of the MFA uh, in Comics program at the California College of the Arts. She'll talk tonight with local luminary, I'm putting it back in there, Julie. Uh, she'll talk tonight with local luminary, Julie Pham. And Julie heads the ION program at Washington Technology Industry Association. With her family, she co-owns co the Northwest Vietnamese News, the oldest private Vietnamese language newspaper in the Pacific Northwest. She managed the newspaper from 2008 to 2011. Julie earned her PhD in history at Cambridge University as a Gates Cambridge Scholar and graduated magna cum laude from UC Berkeley. Her undergraduate thesis, Their War, The Perspectives of the South Vietnamese Military in the Words of Veteran Emigres, was based on 30 original interviews with veterans of the Republic of Vietnam military who now live in Seattle, San Jose, and Sacramento. So super honored to have you here. Thank uh, you, with local us. luminary. <laughs> <laughs> I told them to not say that, said local. <laughs> um, and if I sound nervous, it's because I am, because I'm just so excited to, and honored to, privileged to get to have this conversation with you. Um, so when I was two months old, I left Vietnam with my parents in a boat one year after you did. Mm. And so when I first read your memoir, I saw myself in you. And I saw my parents in your parents. Um, and so I learned so much about my parents' struggles through reading your memoir. And I think that your, what the best we could do, it's, it's not just so valuable for those who are outside the Vietnamese community, but also those within the Vietnamese community because um, it says so much across generations as well. So thank you. Uh, how many Vietnamese people are here? Hi! Nice. Like <laughs> Hi, everybody. The book was for you. Yeah, looks. <laughs> so I'm going to start with the. I'm going to start with a question you probably get asked very often. How did you come up with the idea for this memoir? Uh, well, I had parents who were talkers. There's a lot of people whose parents didn't talk about the the war or like life before America. My parents talked all the time about it, and it was sometimes really disturbing and sometimes like you weren't ready for it because you were just getting ready for school or something or you know like you just weren't emotionally ready for all this heaviness um, but my parents talked about it anyway and so I think I needed personally I needed a place to process all of that stuff um, as like a sensitive artsy kid and then also um, later on as like a you know a politically minded person who like felt um, upset at the many Vietnam War movies and documentaries and representations of the Vietnam War that, were, that are out there, none of them seem to like accurately depict the experiences of my parents or anybody who was Vietnamese American. Um, and so I, you know, I, I just felt like I needed a place to put all of that rage mm. and then all of the access to knowledge that I had to do something about that rage. Well, that rage is beautifully portrayed in, in the, the best we could do. Oh, well, so. thank you. I mean, it took so long to do that I mellowed out over the process. <laughs> Did the rage mellow and the yeah, rage, yeah. by then you were? <laughs> I was like, a, I, was I was a tired mom. <laughs> <laughs> that so will I'm definitely mellow. I'm more mellow now. <laughs> or, or redirect the rage, I guess. Yes. Um, so now the book is an international bestseller. You're on all these lists. You're winning all these awards. And I heard that uh, you've gotten offers for films and TV, and you've said no to all of them. Why is that? Why'd you say no? Uh, well, I mean, there were so many bad Vietnam War movies that it would break my heart to make another one with my own family stories. 
And it's not that I don't think it can happen because clearly I've said yes to tonight's stage reading, um, but that's because I trust Susan and the other actors who are in it. Um, and I trust the Seattle Public Library for doing this thing that like no one is making money from. So at least if we do a bad job, like no one is making money from it. Um, <laughs> Money is not bad. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it, I just don't want to, you know, make money off of doing a bad job of telling the story. Um, and so, I, I don't know. I, I, maybe one day Hollywood will change, but Hollywood needs to, like, have better than good intentions. Hollywood needs to change, like, hiring practices and, like, put Vietnamese American people in charge before I will ever trust it mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the Vietnam War story. So... This is actually the very first time that there is going to be a adaptation, a staged adaptation of your work. You are about to watch a world premiere here. Yeah, yeah. This well, I mean, to be honest, I, I actually do um, um, like a, like live readings mm -hmm. with audience members all around the country, but they're they're not pros. Yes, these are professional actors. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How this, are you? How are you feeling about? I feel so nervous. <laughs> um, I mean, Susan Liu is playing me. This is so surreal. I, I, ha I mean, I had a couple of drinks earlier. <laughs> well, um, with that, why don't we... <laughs> we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, I, I've got to write this down so I can say it well. I'm delighted to welcome <laughs> actors from Book It, Book It Repertory Theater, which is a local theater that adapts uh, books into plays, to perform a stage re uh, reading from The Best We Could Do, um, adapted by Susan Liu and directed by Kathy Shi. The, the Best, best we, we Could Do, do by T. Bui. Rewind, reverse. San Diego, California, 1999. Once upon a time, I was young and moving to New York to be an artist to, and live with my artist boyfriend. Are you going to live together? Um, yes. I see. My mother didn't disown me. For an immigrant kid, that's living the dream. <laughs> a few years earlier, when my oldest sister, Lang, left for medical school and moved in with her boyfriend. And later husband. Ring. Hello? Click. Ring. Hello? Click. Ring. Hello? Hello, Lang! <laughs> It's your mother. Our mother believed that living a boy with a boy before marriage was... Something you just didn't do. The first time one of her daughters did this, ma. Fell apart. My other sister, Bic... Was in college. She'd have a boyfriend since high school, but my brother Thumb and I weren't supposed to talk about him. If Bo or Matt asked, just say it was the three of us at the park. Okay. okay. This secrecy didn't work out very well. It led to a deep rift in our family. Was that boy with you at the park? No. Yes. Okay, yes. Mad didn't stop until she found the truth. How could you read my diary? How could a daughter of mine lie and do such dirty things? I am sorry. Promise me you'll never see him again. It went on like this until Bic ran away from home. Our mother... Went to bed and took a whole bottle of pills. Why didn't we call an ambulance? Lang would have. But she moved out the year before because of problems with Bo. So at home, it was just my little brother and me alone with Bo. We didn't know what to say or do. You don't have a sister named Bit anymore. She's dead to us. I don't know what we would have done if Ma had never gotten out of bed again. We avoided ever talking about that incident to the point that Ma thought I didn't remember it. I don't know if I ever told you, but... I was there! How do you think I could forget something like that? Almost 30 years linger, later, I didn't know I was still angry. These are the people I come from. Matt, but I prefer to be called Matt. Bo. And these are my siblings. Lang. Thumb. And Bic. B-I-C-H, no T. <laughs> <laughs> I have figured out more or less how to raise my little family, but it's both being a parent and a child. Without acting like a child. That eludes me. We're such assholes. We're the lame second generation. My parents escaped, escaped Vietnam, Vietnam on, on a, a boat. boat so their children could grow up in freedom. You'd think I could be more grateful. 
I am not older than my parents were when they made that incredible journey, but I fear that around them, I will always be a child, and they a symbol to me, two sides of a chasm full of meaning and resentment. Travis and I moved to California in 2006 to raise our son near family. Trading the life we had built and loved in New York for a notion I had in my head of becoming closer to my parents as an adult. I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I recognize what it is not. And now I understand proximity and closeness are not the same. By American standards, we live like a tight-knit, multi-generational family. Ma in our backyard, my sister Lang and her family. Two blocks away. Bo. In the senior apartment, four blocks away. My brother Thumb and his family. In the same town. And my sister Vic and her husband, only two towns away. It's like cheers. <laughs> My parents are retired in good health and free to do as they please, but also still lonely, aging, and quietly wishing. We'd take better care of them. In Vietnam, they would be considered very old in their 70s. In America, where people their age run marathons? Or at least live independently. My parents are stuck in limbo between two sets of expectations, and I feel guilty. I didn't grow up with my grandparents around. Ma's parents came to the US when I was 12. They lived two hours away with their oldest son, Hai. From that relationship, I learned how to pour tea and give presents, but nothing about how to be close to my parents. My father always said he had no parents. In my 20s, I learned that my grandfather was still alive in Vietnam and wanted to meet us. Will you go with us, Mo? There's no point. In Vietnam, I met a whole family of half-aunts, uncles and cousins, as well as my father's father. We all tried to convince my father to visit them. He never did. My grandfather died a few years ago. Soon after that trip back to Vietnam. Our first since we escaped in 1978. I began to record our family history, thinking that if I bridged the gap between, between the, the past, past and, and the, the present, present, I could fill the void between my parents and me. And that if I could see Vietnam as a real place and not a symbol of something lost, I would see my parents as real people and learn to love them better. I asked them endless questions about their lives. The war and the country that once was. Home. Ma, always a practical one, would rather we left more, went shopping together. But she humors me with stories and then asks, what should we do about dinner? I don't want to talk about dinner when there are so many more important things we haven't said to each other. I suppose for my mother, I love you, sticks in the throat. So she buys gifts. Try it on. It won't fit. Just try it. And cooks. Ma, really, we can take care of dinner. I've already made dinner. Any green vegetables? Uh, white rice again? I suppose I don't say I love you. Either. How did we get to such a lonely place? We live so close to each other and yet feel so far apart. I keep looking towards the past, tracing our journey in reverse, over the ocean, through the war, seeking an origin story that will set everything right. Initial reaction in one word. God, this is like the Jerry Springer show. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen this this before, and I'm, I'm trying really hard not to cry Do right we need now. a tissue? Yeah. Tissue? I've got one in my pocket. Mm. Oh, all right. This is amazing. Thank you so much. Um, the, what that, that excerpt, what really um, stuck out for me was the void. Um, and this, the, the, how do you fill the void? And people being so close, and yet so far away. And when there's a void um, in our narrative, then uh, I know I do this, I make up stories. 
I make up stories, when my own explanations, when there aren't explanations for me. And sometimes those stories are, are also like secrets. So, could you talk about how you went about finding, learning about, discovering these secrets in your family? Um, I, I happened upon oral history as a really cool tool for getting my parents to talk to me by telling them that they could help me on a school project. <laughs> Asian parents love to help kids with school. That's right. <laughs> so it was my, um, my Trojan horse for getting my parents to open up about things and then be willing to talk and talk again and again and again about really uncomfortable subjects like while being recorded because um, it was all for, for grad school. Um, and because it was for grad school and there was like a finite amount of time in which I had to get it done, it also pushed me to like go past my comfort zone too. Um, and, you know, really nailed on the chronology of like a really painful series of events in my dad's life and my mom's life as well later on. Um, and then go through the painful process of like uh, transcribing mm. every single word of those recorded interviews and then often translating them from Vietnamese to English as well. So all of that's like a, like a lot of labor um, that you might not necessarily do if it's just like a side project for your family history. But if you're doing it for school, then, um, you know, there's an external force driving you to, to, to get it done. Mm -hmm. And then the, the presentation was like a whole other question because I realized that after I got it done and compiled it for my... my um, oral history final project, um, that there was all this amazing material that I really wanted to share with other people. And my, my own family members were really excited about it. They were more excited about it than anything that I'd ever done as an artist before that. So I knew that I was like holding something really, really precious. Um, but no one was going to read it except for my thesis advisor and my family. And so to find um, a way to share it with a broader audience was then like the next step. And as they were, so it's great that they were actually also really excited about you sharing all those secrets too. Um, oh, well, you know, it, they weren't so much the secrets at that point. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so there are times where um, what your parents remembered and what your siblings remembered, how they remembered those stories mm -hmm. were different. How'd you reconcile that? Well, that, that, that was one of the things that like actually researching oral history was helpful for because oral history is like notorious for being kind of um, unreliable, memory is really unreliable, but you know, in the face of um, like dominant narratives overshadowing um, other perspectives, like oral history is a really important tool to like reset the balance. And so, um, you know, then I had to deal with it and a way to deal with it was to have like not one, but multiple voices. And this was like a really amazing embodiment of like how important it is to have multiple, multiple voices telling a story. Um, because there is no single truth, there's no mm -hmm. single story, and the, mo the more you can work against the single story, the closer you get to telling the truth. That's one of the things I love about your book, because they will see different perspectives right. on how, uh, may I remember this, and how Bo remembered this, and, yeah. and you just put it side by side like that. And all of that is influenced by their gender, their mm -hmm. class, their age, their, ex their life experience. Mm -hmm. The truth and what we want to remember is the truth. Yeah. Right. Well, let's, um, let's watch some more storytelling. The Holding Pen. Berkeley, California. 2015. My parents have been separated since I was 19. They remain friends and take care of each other so often, it looks like they are still a couple. Until, Until it, it doesn't. doesn't. <laughs> Bo, do you remember when we were born? Did you really go to the movies like Ma said? What? I never. Your mother always saying things to make me look bad. You went to the movies. I was there for Tom's birth. I know about that. I drove you to the hospital for the other birds. Except for Bit, because I was living in another town then. I was in the waiting room. It was Vietnam. They don't let men come in, put on a surgical mask, and watch. And if I did go to the movies, it was because I was scared. I was scared my wife would die and I'd be left alone. 
You went when Zhang Guiyan was born. Was Bo so terrible? It's hard to remember. My memories of him live in an orange apartment building in San Diego, California. I remember blinding concrete. And the rectilinear shapes of lawns and parking lots. Bottle brush and cypress. Those stairs. And the claustrophobic darkness inside our home. I remember streets named after states and schools. Named after presidents. And imagine each block, each day. Turned us a little more American. The same month we moved into the, the orange, orange building. building, a 16-year-old girl in San Diego aimed her rifle at the elementary school children across the street from our house, killing two people and injuring nine. San Diego was a naval and marine corps base where the wounds of the Vietnam War were still fresh. And not everyone welcomed our presence. I learned about America mostly through books and TV and from what my sister learned in school. Every morning we have to say, I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible. indivisible. And as though as this induction into Americanhood needed any more nudging. You stupid gook! <sighs> there were reasons to not want to be anything other for my parents. Al already fully formed. In another time and place. To which they could never go back. Home becomes the holding pen for the frustrations and the unexercised demons that have nowhere to go in America's finest city. Any luck with the Board of Ed? It's impossible. They don't recognize our d degrees here. There's a job at the company where my sister works. It's minimum wage, but it's full time. You'd be putting circuit boards together. That sounds terrible. Fine. Then I'll take it. OK. Looking back, it was a bad decision for Ball to be the one to stay home with two small children. At the time, I only knew that Ma would be gone before the sun was up, and Thumb would be at the window crying if he missed her or she forgot to look up and wave goodbye. My sisters got themselves ready and walked to school on their own, leaving Thumb and me alone with Bo. And the TV. I remember he smoked a lot, and sometimes he played with us and it was good. Wow, five smoke rings in a row. <laughs> but, but the problem was we never knew when his anger would strike. Vroom, vroom! Quiet. Or what sinister thing he would bring home to live with us, Bo? Hung up a new portrait of a woman in a grassy field. And we hide under blankets, looking at it, wondering, why is she naked? Is it a ghost? Bo told us scary stories, not to entertain, but to educate. If you hear a voice calling your name that you don't recognize, hey. don't answer it. It is the spirit trying to trick you into opening your mouth to enter your body. Did he? Know that he terrified us? Knock, knock, knock. We'd all look as the shadows became bigger and bigger on the frosty glass on the front door. Just pretend we're not here. And then Bo would leave the living room, leaving the kids to... Knock, knock. The glass panels in our door, meant to let light into the dark apartment, only made it harder to ignore the shadows outside. Thumb would hold his breath till he couldn't hold it any longer, but even his hiding place was fraught with danger. The naked lady's hand would reach for me in the closet. I was never safe. Thumb developed the habit of... Hiding in the closet for hours, holding my bowel movements and trying not to mess my pants. I conversely became obsessed with the supernatural. I read and reread Bo's books about paraphernalia, studying the pictures until I had memorized every, every disturbing, disturbing detail. detail. And so, we spent the days. We didn't go outside to play until Lan came home. And then we'd stay out as long as we could. <laughs> Jumping into mass arms was, when she got home was the best part. <laughs> In the evening, we would often watch a movie together. I remember watching The Exorcist when I was five. We, we didn't have restrictions on what we could watch and we didn't have a bedtime like other children did. In my sleep, I dreamt of how terrible it would be to not find my way home. I never had dreams about flying or thoughts of running away from home. I remember Bo told us about... Astral projection. A friend of your uncle's was known to project in his sleep. 
As a joke, his friends dress him up while he slept. His spirit didn't recognize his body when it tried to return. All the spirits possessed him. So afterward, it was as if he's gone insane. Bo slept alone in his bed at night and... Practiced leaving his body. I practiced being brave. Once I realized I could impress others simply by pretending not to be scared, acting tough became a way to overcome the terror. I'm so thirsty. Me too. But the kitchen's scary in the dark. I'll go. Really? No way. The dead aren't supposed to talk to us. We are on different planes. If we can open a door between worlds, we can also shut it. And I can close my eyes and turn away. If I could close my eyes, I could sleep. And if I could sleep, I could dream. Though my world was small, I would sometimes dream of being free in it. Blood and rice. Me and Bo, we're, we're okay, okay now. now. To stop being scared of him, I grew up. And went away. And now that I've come back, we can sit in my mother's studio, both of us visitors. Neither one owing the other. To understand how my father became the way he was, I had to learn what happened to him as a little boy. It took a long time to learn. The right questions to ask. When I did. The stories pour forth with no beginning or end. Anecdotes without shapes, wounds beneath wounds. Shall I begin the story of the pond in Haiphong? In 1951, when Vietnam was still part of French Indochina, my grandfather and great uncle built a street in the northern city of Haiphong. Haiphong was a seaport, the most important in the north, 200 kilometers from the border of China. First, they built the row and named it after themselves. Then they began to dig. They dug the clay for the foundations of houses that they built on small lots. Nine meters long and three meters wide. Mm. The more houses they built. The bigger the hole got. Rains came and filled the hole. People planted water hyacinth, water spinach, and morning glories, and stocked the pond with shrimp and fish. It was there that Bo taught himself how to swim. My father fished for small shrimp. Which were so plentiful. One morning, his grandparents' deck were covered with hundreds of shrimp that had crawled up during the night. A fabric dyer moved into one of the houses. Eventually, the dyes he poured into the water killed all the pond life, and there was no more fishing. Each of Bo's stories about childhood has a different shape, but all <coughs> the same ending. When Bo was two, Bo got very sick. What's wrong with him now? He's burning up, and he has boils all over his body. Keep him on wet leaves and keep changing them. He could die out here. The jungle is no place for a child. We'll have to go back to the city. War caused shortages and inflation. While the people had less to eat, the French and Japanese army hoarded the rice and even burnt it as fuel for trains when oil was scarce. Farmers were forced to uproot their rice and plant jute, which was used to make sandbags, ropes, and other army needs. I remember waiting all day for food. Dinner, water spinach. That's it? No fish sauce even? Quiet! What do you contribute? Every once in a while, my mother would scrape together a few cents and run out and buy a blood sausage. Just a small piece, wrapped in banana leaf. She sneaked home. Crawl under the cover of the bed curtains. And call to me. She lowered the curtains. And we'd eat in secret. Just my mother and me. When I was five, my father fell in love with the neighbor Pretty at the end of the street. Why do you always leave us? Stay out of my business! And then? One night, Bo watched as his father beat his mother badly. And threw her out. That was the last time Bo ever saw his mother. 
This was in 1945, at the height of the famine. Where did she go? How did she survive? The dead pile up in doorways, having sought in them a place to rest at night. By day, they were hauled away on open carts. The family disbanded. My father and grandfather, each focused on his own survival, went separate ways. Bo's father joined the Viet Minh. Because they would feed him. In Loi Dong, under his grandmother's protection, Bo escaped starvation. But many others still suffered. Bo's father came only to announce his departure. I'm off to fight for the revolution. Where's my son? Tell my boy to come here. Here, Papa. Bo's father kicked Bo square in the stomach, throwing him onto the floor. You're not my Papa. And in the dark apartment in San Diego, I grew up with the terrified boy who would become my father. Afraid of my father craving safety and comfort, I had no idea that the terror I felt was only the long shadow of his own. When I was working on this book, he visited my studio and I showed him a drawing of his childhood. Mm. You know how it was for me. And why later I wouldn't be so normal. When I first read your book and I kept thinking, she experienced that too? Wow, that happened to her too. Even though there was that the the scene with the creepy neighbor, <laughs> for the and and the way that our parents tried to express love um, in a way that's so different from what looks like on TV, um, and just all the stories that we'd come up with with our siblings. And reading your book, I just felt I'm not alone. Um, and there are so many things that are so similar. So. Um, I, though, can't imagine sharing all the things that you shared, all the secrets that you shared. So earlier you were talking about, in the beginning, your parents were, or your family, they were really excited about it, they were proud. And um, what did they, uh, how, when, when it was clear that you were gonna have to share stuff that was really, that could bring shame, or at least that's the way I would look at it. Um, how did they feel about, did you hesitate? First of all, did you hesitate? And then how did you go about getting their, their permission slash blessing for sharing those secrets, those family secrets? Um, I, I guess I should uh, make it clear for everybody that it took me over 10 years <laughs> to get this sucker done. <laughs> and part of that was, you know, the learning curve and, you know, teaching and raising a kid at the same time. But the other was fear of doing further violence, mm -hmm. right? Um, and like, although I was doing it for school and that helped, um, my thesis advisor was also a very conscientious, politically minded person who would quote Edward Said to me and say, all forms of representation are violent, which didn't help. <laughs> um, I, was, I was really paralyzed with fear and I think it was actually when I gave birth to my son that I went through something very real and very concrete that was like scary, but you, you have to get the baby out, right? Like it doesn't go back in, it can't stay there. <laughs> and, and so I got the baby out and I figured, well, if I can get the baby out, I can get the book out. <laughs> and that was Another baby. that. <laughs> yes, um, right, so it was like, a, like life taught me that like sometimes you can do stuff that you're not prepared to do. And that taught me what my parents went through. Like it's not, you know, I don't think it was ever in their life plan to like uproot themselves and throw their lives and their children's lives to the wind and take this huge risk and go in a boat illegally to another country and then like, you know, start new lives on the other side of the world, but they did it. Um, so I guess it was, it was all part of that same trajectory. Was it easier for you to get acceptance from one parent over the other or from some siblings and not, or is it depending on what you shared or were they, I mean, how did that, as you kind of start to share pieces of the work with them? 
Um, my, my father was a, was a big collaborator. Um, and he was, of course, you know, the one who stood to lose the most mm -hmm. because he's not um, portrayed in the most flattering way at all times. But I think that he gets it in, in that, like, he's, he's been writing, he's been, like, sorting his affairs and getting ready for the long goodbye for probably the last 30 years. Um, <laughs> and there, there is something about that that makes you ready to tell your story because you want to sell your debts and you want to, like make the, the jumbled mess that is your life like a coherent narrative. And so he was actually a really willing collaborator in the telling of his life story. Um, and I think he really enjoyed it. Um, my mother, I believe, will live forever, or she believes that she will live forever. My and mom too. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So she's, you know, she doesn't really wanna, she didn't really wanna do it. Um, but I think she was actually, she's actually oddly enough like more politically minded so I think like the idea that we were doing something that was going to be important for Vietnamese people um, really motivated her to go beyond her comfort zone and like you know tell our story in a way that was um, not always like super flattering to her and maybe compromising, but it was going to be good for Vietnamese people. How do they feel about it now that you're getting flown everywhere and the book is so famous and are they oh yeah I knew all along or what was it I I don't know mm -hmm. you know they they they, they say cũng được you know? <laughs> it's okay like, good job you know like but they don't they don't make much they don't they don't let me get a big head about it I I mean I think they probably say some nice stuff behind my back yeah right but not to me yeah. so I wouldn't know what yeah. they think about yeah. it yeah um so this, um, the best we could do, it's, there, on one hand I think about it as filling this, this void of the, the story of your parents, of this, the personal narrative. Um, but it also fills this other void, this void in the historical narrative of the, of the Vietnam War. Um, because in this, you, you offer a different perspective than the perspective that is unusually in American films and history books. Um, and I think that the next excerpt gets at that really well. Heroes and losers. Saigon, Vietnam. 1976. My parents began to talk of escape. My friend, too, knows someone who has a boat. Escapes had to be planned secretly, and one needed connections. The boat owner got caught. And there's something else that worries me. Our next-door neighbor has been spying on us. He mentioned we might be getting paid a visit soon. We can't have these novels around the house. The communists call this capitalist filth. Lan! Yes, ma? You can read any of our books you like. Read it all before it gets burned. Hey, where's the last chapter to Heavenly Sword and Dragon Saber? Oh, I already burned it! Oh, no, now I'll never know how it ends. You just gotta read faster. One evening, my parents got the first of many visits from our neighborhood monitor. The cadre. cadre! Smells good in here. What are you eating? You always eat this well? Ma thought to herself, we're eating half portions. Wow. White rice. There was a word for our kind, mui. It means false, lying, deceitful. It could be applied to anyone in the South. It meant constant monitoring, distrust, and the ever-present feeling that our family could, at any moment, be, be separated. separated. Our, our safety, safety jeopardized. jeopardized. And then Bull was let go from his job. Around the same time, the currency changed. Those bastards. No matter how much you exchange, all you get back is 200 dong. That was all we had. And now it feeds our family for less than a month? I'm going out. I need a smoke. Ma felt left alone to provide for our family. And Bo fell into a deep de depression. Which Ma had no sympathy for. There's no future here. Even my kids won't be able to get a more than a sixth grade education. One day in 1976, we received an unexpected visitor bringing news from the North. Father? It had been more than 20 years since Ball had seen his father. Your mother came to Haifam looking for you. She came once before in the 50s, but you'd already left. 
all this time? I thought she was dead. Why didn't you tell me? There's a lot you don't understand. It was wartime. All anyone was trying to do was survive. Let's forgive and forget. And what? The happy family again? Well, no. You see, your wife's family, they're just too... Wait. I can't risk being associated. That was the last time they saw each other. Will you write to your mother? What would I say after all these years? Your father gave me his ring. Sell it! Possessions sold to northerners relocating to Saigon through mass diligence. Turned into food. The daily fight to survive wore me down while the constant surveillance riled me up. What's wrong, Ma? Oh, <laughs> I'm just tired and worried about your Uncle Hai. It's been over a year since he was arrested and we're not sure where he is. Oh, school. It's okay. Uh, what are you learning? We're learning how to report suspicious behavior. <laughs> they said we should even report our parents. Bo's friend, too, tried to organize another escape, but on the day of... We got busted. Our scouts never show up. Ma was running out of things to sell. Bo's grandmother was very old and sick. And to complicate matters more... I'm pregnant. New family planning laws require Ma to get an abortion, but Ma... Remembered her two lost babies. The doctor took pity. You don't want to do this, do you? I'll say it would be dangerous to your health. Thank you. Just as the future seemed impossible, another, another chance, chance opened, opened up. up. Han, wait up. Gyu, is anything wrong? Gyu was the wife of Ma's brother, Hai. It's not... My brother, is it? No, Hai is alive. They finally let me see him. It is something else. Can you come by the house tonight? Uh? Hai's in-laws had found a boat for sale and wanted to escape the country. Matt? Knew a person with enough money to buy it. The in-laws would sell places on the boat and repay the investor for her role as an in-between. Matt would receive a space for, us, for all of us on the boat. What about your grandmother? She's all alone now. There's no way she'll survive the trip at sea. And what if she cries and gets us all caught? We can't even tell her we're going. We arranged for my parents to look after her. Gas and food were brought and snuck, snuck on the boat a little at a time. Spaces on the boat were bought in gold bars or promises of repayment. And finally, in March of 1978... My brother Hai was released from prison. We leave next week. Are you in or out? By then, Ma was eight months pregnant. What choice do we have? We packed our papers and one change of clothes for each of us. In the middle of the night, we woke up the children to go. It's time. You're not coming back, are you? Don't be silly, Grandma. We'll be back in a few days. We took the early morning bus from Saigon to Gan Te, where we were supposed to meet our contact. We sat, we stood. We waited. He, he was, was very, very late. late. Finally, at dusk, we arrived at the dock where the boat and the rest of the passengers were anxiously waiting for us. At last. I was worried we'd have to leave without you. Hi, I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> Go on down and get settled. Nam, can I show you something? Look, girls, don't be scared. I'll point out the people that we know. There's Uncle Hai, Aunt Gyo, and your cousins. Oh, Mr. Cho is the pilot. He was in the Navy and then in prison with Uncle Hai. One-Eyed Hai is also a friend from Uncle, of Uncle Hai's from prison. <laughs> Dinner. Here, sis, saved you one. <laughs> Try to eat something. <laughs> Try to sleep. Ow! Stop kicking! Crash! What have you done? I don't know. Those are river islands. We must have hit one. Keep your voice down. The patrol bulls are coming. Dead Roy! Our pilot, Mr. Chow, has just jumped in the water. All we can do now is wait for the tide to rise. And then a wet Mr. Chow emerged from the water. 
Are they gone? All as well. I pulled algae off the r rudder, and there's enough water now to get Mama moving. Coast is clear, but we've got a problem. He just lies there shivering. I can't go back to pr pr prison. Can you drive a boat? There's lights up ahead. You class A moron. That's the same river we drove out of. We need to elect a new pilot, someone capable. I think Nam could do it. Yes, Nam, you drive. Show me what I need to know to get us to Malaysia. You're a quick study, Nam. 100 kilometers east to international water, 700 kilometers southwest to Malaysia. Okay, got it? Look, bigger ships. Let's, let's flag them down to rescue us. Those are Thai fishing boats. Could be pirates. Uh, how do you know? I don't, but we still have gas, food, and water. We stay away, the hell away from them. Look, when I turn, they turn, they follow. Oh God, if they catch us. Don't you think I want to protect my wife and family as much as you do yours? Oh, Nam, you did it. They're not following us anymore. Water, Lang, go get some water for yourself and your sister. Lang walks over to the water tank, drink it, and then throw up all over the floor. Keep it down. We're trying to keep the boat running over here. I don't feel good about pouring fuel near a flame. We could turn it off first. Uh, yeah, okay. Now we light it up, I guess. What's going on? Why's the engine off? I tried to give us pointing sails, but hurry up. Try again. Bo's compass starts to spin. Oh, shit. Bo steered the boat in a safe direction. And then Uncle Hai pulled the hatch to the bottom deck open. Whew. There! Thank God! <laughs> it's night. We can leave this cover off. Ah, look! Oh, it's the belt of Orion. Keep your eyes on it and you'll feel less sick. <sighs> on the third day, Mao walked over to the water tank, smelt it, and... Oh, how could you piss in the washing water? It was dark. I was sleepy. Hey, I see land! <gasps> land? Land? We're close to land! I've been saving these, but now I can make you lemonade to give us a little energy and to celebrate. Fishermen! They're leading us to shore. They're signaling to us. Light a lantern. Everybody, get ready. We're almost at the shore. And then an oar hit Ball's body and he fell into the sea. But he was lucky because he knew how to swim. <laughs> he arrived to shore and guns were all pointing to his head. Uh, I am Vietnamese from boat. They're letting us land. We reached Malaysia. Lad, get ready to go. Don't lose your shoes. What I really appreciate about this part is how it fills, fills in that void for that, that historical narrative. Because not only do you tell the story of your, your parents and your family, but you also tell the story of the Vietnam War from the perspective of the South Vietnamese refugee community. Um, I remember when I was studying history uh, and reading about the Vietnam War, and what I saw was, oh, the Vietnam War is between Vietnamese and Americans. Hmm, but the Vietnamese, they're only talking about the communists. And so actually, the South Vietnamese really had no voice, no place. And it wasn't until I actually started talking to my dad, who served in the Navy for three years, and then, or served in the Navy, and then went to re-education camp for three years, and that's, uh, that's the reason why we fled Vietnam, did I begin to understand a different perspective, a different side of the war, um, and also recognize, wow, there's the, all the stories that are in American media are so, um, are so one-sided. And you bring up this, um, you bring up the word Nguyen. 
And I think that's such an interesting word because it's, it means traitor, it means um, enemy. And in this, you talk about it meant for everyone in the South. Um, during the war, the communists would use it to uh, describe anyone who's affiliated with the South Vietnamese government, the South Vietnamese military, because um, they were said to have been puppets of the Americans. But um, actually what you show is school teachers, anyone in the South, or, um, what the, the, the danger that your parents felt, um, even though your, your father hadn't served. And, um, and often when we think about the, the Vietnamese refugee experience, it's okay, the Americans pulled out of this war that they really shouldn't have been in, and refugees are coming to the US because that's the right thing to do. But we actually don't talk about why did they leave. So this, this part, it, it reminds me of, there's this, um, there's this poem um, called Home, and it's written by this uh, uh, Warshawn Shire, who's this Somali British writer, and the, the poem Home is, it's, it's kind of an anthem to the, the refugee community. And in this poem, there's this line, and it says, you have to understand, no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. And what you, what you showed was why, how the land was so dangerous. And I think that's what's missing. We don't know why people left. Um, so, and I think part of that is because my parents didn't talk about it until I started asking them explicitly. So many, or parents' generation, like, they didn't talk about it. How did you get your, how did you get your, um, your parents to talk about that part, about the part where, what life was like after the war ended? Um, what is known in Vietnam as reunification and yet by South Vietnamese as loss of country? Well, actually, it wasn't very hard to get my parents to talk about it. My parents talked about it all the time, and my experience of like other Vietnamese um, refugees who are, you know, here and all around the world is they want to talk about it. But the the bigger question is why why doesn't anybody listen to them, mm -hmm. right? And um, I think Viet Thanh Nguyen is very succinct in his um, nonfiction book uh, Nothing Ever Dies. He says that all wars are fought twice, once on the battlefield and a second time in memory. And the US has successfully won the Vietnam War in memory by making itself the main character of the story of the Vietnam mm -hmm. War. And so in doing that, it has successfully erased the experience of the Vietnamese people who fled Vietnam after the war. And it has erased the fact that it was a civil war that tore it apart. I mean, it was a civil war that was made much worse by foreign intervention, of course, but the fact that it was a civil war means that there were more than two sides if there was the US also. Um, and it's not that we wanna keep taking sides. In fact, we wanna move beyond the taking of sides 40 years later, but the fact that there are hundreds of thousands of people whose story can, like year after year, generation after generation is ignored and invisibilized and often complained, uh, portrayed completely wrong. They're called puppets and traitors by one side. They're just completely overlooked by the other or mistaken as commies or gooks or, you know, as, as the people who, who they fought or who were they were defeated by. That is so dehumanizing and so upsetting for people that it makes them sort of like ghosts, like they can't move beyond their own demons. And so um, I'm more interested in helping people heal at this point but in order for them to heal, their stories have to be heard. And so you have to acknowledge where their wounds come from. So it is very important to go back into the archives of this war that is so old now um, and, and correctly name who the players were, who was affected, and then maybe move into the next step, which would be to acknowledge that wrongs were done on all sides. And so aside from the interviews, the oral histories that you did, what... Um, with your family, what kind of other research did you do to, to, cause you show so many different aspects. I mean, I actually really love the, there's that one part in the book where you dissect the, the photograph by Eddie Adams, that famous photograph where he shows um, a general killing a Viet Cong leader. And then you actually tell the story behind that. Like how did you go about doing your research? 
Uh, well, there's a documentary on the on on Eddie Adams, and um, you know he is on camera talking about all of his regrets around the effects of that that photograph, and that he did, he didn't feel like he deserved a Pulitzer for it, and he was really upset that it had like ruined the general's life, and he actually went to like find the general and was really sad that he was in America working at a pizza restaurant. Um, and you know he regretted that there were like efforts to try to deport the general um, here in the U.S. Um, and then there, there's a lot of reading to do. Um, some of it's good, like that documentary, and some of it is just like you know same old same old crap. Um, and and so it's just like upsetting and 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 then therefore motivating to try to offer an alternative based on things that I did have access to. Um, a lot of it was in Vietnamese, published by like the Vietnamese language press and, and publishing here in the US. And some of that can be um, a bit biased in its own way too. Um, I know, so we run a newspaper. Right, right, right. <laughs> so you just have to like keep balancing all of the many voices to like that, again, like try to include as many voices as possible to try to get to the truth. Yes, and like you said earlier, there is no one single truth. Exactly. There are multiple truths. Right. So, are you ready for the last? Fire and ash. We eventually found ourselves in California in... 1979. I found us our own apartment at, as quickly as possible. We received food stamps and assistance for families with children at first. But we get off welfare as soon as Ma could support us with her job. On 3.35 an hour and countless sacrifices. Little by little, my parents built their bubble around us. Our home in, in America. America. They taught us to be respectful, to take care of one another. And to do well in school. Those were the intended lessons. The unintentional ones came from their unexercised demons and from the habits they formed over so many years of trying to survive. We learned what was important to survive. Lock the door. Always be the best in your class. And what was not. Where's my magic slate? Where are all my Dr. Seuss books? I gave them away. You're too old for them now. I am always amazed at the amount of stuff some people have in their lives. My family kept sparse records of our existence. Our most important possession was this unassuming brown file folder in which my parents placed the most essential pieces of our identity. Our birth certificates translated and notarized, our green cards, and our social security cards. When we began school, we were each given a brown folder of our own. Into this folder went our report cards, certificates, and awards, and the annual class picture. No individual school pictures. Those were too expensive. When I was nine, my parents passed the test to become American citizens, and our naturalization papers went straight into the important documents folder. Eventually, Lang's folder reached capacity, and the awards became wooden plaques and shiny trophies that adorned her bedroom. By the time Lang graduated high school and went to college, Ma had acquired her own certificates. Piecing together lunchtime workshops and night courses. To build up the career she had begun on the assembly line at three dollars an hour. Han, you're such a good student. Would you stay on as a teaching assistant next term? What do you think? It means I have to keep driving you at night. I have my license. It's different here. You won't be able to do it. I can drive. You know, you could use the course credits I earn and, learn and study something you like. Bo tried his hand at graphic design while Ma continued courses in mathematical drafting. I love looking at the drawings they each made, but what I loved more were the nights when they were at school because Lang would come home from college to watch us. I remember two kinds of spaghetti. Wow. Meat sauce and squash and mushrooms! <laughs> and bedtime stories from the Iliad. After Paris steals Helen and runs away with her, Agamemnon leads the Greek fleet to attack the city of Troy. I'd lie there savoring the luxury of spending time together, the marvel of being told stories in bed, and the curious freedom of being home without our parents. <laughs> One night when I was 14, T, do you want to watch a movie? Ball rented Die Hard. Okay. It was fit. That's why my parents happened to be at home. Crash! 
The normal response might have been to go to see what was happening. Ours was immediately lock the door. And rush to the bedroom to hide. But then... Boom! Boom! What would a normal 14-year-old response have been? Some kind of freak out, maybe? All I know is a switch flipped in my brain, and I acted purely by reflex. Evacuate. I grabbed the important brown documents folder, wet a rag, put on my shoes, gave the folder to Bo, covered my nose with a rag, and walked out of the apartment building to a scene of uncoming fire trucks. The fire had started downstairs. The old couple, smokers with emphysema, fell asleep with a lit cigarette. Their oxygen tanks exploded. This is a night I learned what my parents have been preparing me for my whole life, that not any particular piece of Vietnamese culture is my inheritance, but the inexplicable need and extraordinary ability to run when shit hits the fan. <laughs> my refugee reflex. When they say we could. We went back to our smoke-filled home that same night, seeing that the inside of our apartment was still intact and the danger passed. We put away our important documents. And then went to sleep. Ebb and flow. New York, Methodist Hospital, November 2005. T has just given birth to her first son. I don't think I was prepared for this. There were so many things I didn't know about being a parent until I became one. I, I didn't believe that babies actually ate every two hours, sometimes more, both day and night, that no matter how natural it may seem, it is not easy to feed a baby from your breast. Ow! That, that sometimes it takes three people to wrestle your baby into place. I've got his legs. I, ow, yeah, I need to change his grip on me. I'll help you move his head. I, that indifferences to my struggle could cause me to feel so helpless and alone. Are we done yet? The ba <laughs> Baby's due for a checkup. I didn't know about jaundice. What does she mean our baby is yellow? He's half Asian? <laughs> <laughs> or that they would keep my baby in the hospital and discharge me? Phototherapy will help, but the more fluids he passes through him, the more toxins he can flush out. It needs to be mother's milk or a formula. I'll nurse him. How long? It's hard to say. I thought about the mortality of my infant son. Ma? What was it like when Zhang Qing was sick in the hospital? I mean, at the end? I remember they had her in a sealed box, like an incubator to help her breathe. She slept most of the time because she was so weak. But suddenly she woke up, and when she saw me, her face lit up with a smile. It was like she was making me a gift of our last moment together. My mother and I hugged about the daughter she lost, my sister I never knew. Travis and I rented a room across the street from the hospital. He set the alarm so we would sleep in 90 minute intervals. Rising to slip on our coats and shuffle across the street. Let's walk faster to warm up. I can't. My stitches. Oh, right. Sorry. Feed our baby as best as we could in the 20 minutes allowed. And return to our room to repeat the process over and over. That first week of parenting was the hardest week of my life and the only time I ever fall called upon to be called heroic. However much my body wanted to rest, a force pulled me onto my feet with a clear and simple directive, keep him alive. When the hospital finally released our son, it still too, took both of us. I'm holding him down to get him to nurse. In the last moments at the hospital, I waited for Travis to get the car. The lactation consultant gently asked me, One last try? Well, okay. Great. Here's how it works. Sweater off. Pillow strap on. Baby wraps off. Breast <laughs> out. And baby <laughs> latches. I'll leave the two of you alone. Alone with my son and feeling competent about it. For the first time, I relaxed and I started to speak to him. Child, it's 
mother. I could hear echoes of my mother's voice speaking to me in my own childhood. But I could feel the voice coming from my own throat. As a child, I thought my mother's voice was beautiful. She hated it, but I loved its raspiness. Minsup vive. We are about to go home. Minsup vive. We are going home. When my mother spoke to me, she spoke softly, the tones of Vietnamese giving it music. Not high and reedy, but scratchy and bluesy. I always wished I had her voice. When my mother spoke to her children, she called herself man. The term used in the North, a weighty, serious, more elegant word for mother. We preferred the Southern word ma, a jo jolly, bright sound we insisted fit her better. I wonder now how I would feel if my son did something like that to me. Having a child taught me certainly that I am not the center of the universe. But being a child, even a grown-up one, seems to me to be a lifetime pass for selfishness. We hang resentment onto the things our parents did to us, or the things they didn't do for us. And in my case, call them by the wrong name. To accidentally call myself man was to slip myself into her shoes just for a moment, to let her not be what I want her to be. But someone independent, self-determining, and free. How do I let go of all the anger I put away? I wasn't ready to lose my mother when I was 13, but now at 40 I know that our time on earth is finite. What becomes of us after we die? Do we live on in what we leave to our children? How much of me is my own and how much is stamped into my blood and bone? Predestined? I used to imagine that history had infused my parents' lives with the dust of a cataclysmic explosion, that it had seeped through their skin and became part of their blood, that being my father's child, I too was a product of war, and being my mother's child could never measure up to her. But maybe being their child simply means that I will always feel the weight of their past. Nothing that happened makes me special, but my life is a gift that is too great, a debt I can never repay. Do you think that writing this memoir closed that void for you? No. There's no happy endings. That's the that's the spoiler. Um, just as the um, the 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 arc of the immigrant story, as it is known to us, where um, you know our, our characters uh, overcome insurmountable obstacles to make it to the promised land, and then life is hap lived happily ever after, is not true. Um, it is also not true that the story of um, a search for one's origin and um, closeness over proximity ends all happy. Um, there are moments definitely of um, real connection and understanding, but um, joy is ephemeral, understanding is ephemeral, um, and then we just have the memory of it later. So um, luckily books let us um, freeze those moments uh, for ourselves so that we can remember the lessons and the feeling um, and pass it on hopefully or share it with other people but you know stories are essentially lies they're not exactly the truth uh, my mother will tell everybody that you know we told T the truth and she wrote down whatever she wanted <laughs> <laughs> so again this is my telling of my family's story 
and it is limited, but you know what? It was the best I could do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, after, I'm going to ask this question. For, uh, what did you, so this is about the artwork. Um, because this is, this is a graphic memoir. What did you hope to achieve by limiting colors to red, orange, ink washes? Um, what is the color scheme guiding us to? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to rip off the veil of, like, um, you know, symbolism and stuff and just reveal that it's cheap <laughs> to... <laughs> practical, practical. Yes, I'm, I mean, I'm a refugee, right? <laughs> yes. So, like... The refugee and, reflex. <laughs> also, I had to stay within budget. Like, the, the book was budgeted for black and white. And then um, I asked the publisher halfway through the process if I could have any color. And I was like, I learned about duotone. And I was like, could we do duotone? And they did some research into how much it would cost. And they came back and said, you can afford one color. <laughs> um, so I had to, you know, I went through the entire Pantone uncoded library. And I found... Um, a few different things that I tested out on like different shades of white paper and I found like the right shade of like warm um, sunny afternoons in Sa San Diego, the orange apartment building, the color of um, old Kodak prints from the 1970s and 80s that are starting to fade. Mm -hmm. It's the yeah. color of nostalgia yeah. for me. It's actually, as you say, it kind of reminds, I'm thinking that almost that sepia. Yeah. Just a little warmer than sepia. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a long question. Um, in your book, you discussed going back to your parents about the war and their stance on it, which was confusing for you. Have you made any new developments on your stance on the war? I ask this because as a Vietnamese American teenager trying to find my identity, that is made more confusing with media and school portrayals of the war, um, I don't know what to believe. Additionally, any tips on how to talk about the war and refugee experience with parents that are afraid of exposing me to it, to fill the void? Um, read widely. Um, do more than watch the Ken Burns documentary. Mm -hmm. um, also, take everything with a grain of salt because experience is limited and um, it was a highly divisive war. People had to take sides, often because of circumstances that really didn't have much to do with their actual beliefs. Um, and just understand that it was a complicated situation. People, um, f people fought their brothers. Um, people switched sides. Um, people were just trying to survive and often didn't take sides but had to. Um, and then also people were hurt. And even if, um, you know, we have the luxury now of looking back and, you know, taking intellectual sides, people then didn't, and they also suffered. And so their wounds are real. And that's something that I have to remember when I talk to people who experience the war from different um, perspectives than my own, is that I have to respect that their wounds are real, even if their political stance is not like my own. Um, and I think that respect will help us do a better job of listening to each other's stories. And I hope that that actually extends to the Vietnamese government now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually trying to get the, Viet the, the best we could do translated and published in Vietnam. Um, but it's difficult because um, there are pages that the government would like to censor, but they don't know how to do that with a graphic novel. <laughs> um, um, and, and, and there are stories from Vietnam, from Vietnamese writers, um, like the amazing Nguyen Phan Quay Mai, whose um, novel, uh, The Mountain Sing, is actually going to be published in English in the U.S. next year. Um, and, and she tells a very similar story of three generations that experienced the same history, but from the side of the North. Mm -hmm. I read it in an early draft, and I cried and cried and cried, and we wrote to each other about how why we hadn't heard these stories from each other before. She grew up not knowing that there had been refugees leaving Vietnam. And the first time she encountered books from the diaspora, she didn't believe them. 
because she had never been exposed to them and she just believed that they were probably US propaganda. But slowly over time, as she was exposed to more and more stories, she realized, oh, these are actual real stories that I just never knew were real. Um, and I feel the same um, realization could happen for, for us about stories you know, from the other side. And so we have a lot to learn too about the communists, like this monolithic block that we've been taught to um, fear or loathe. And, and there's so much more to learn, but it starts with one having access to each other's stories and listening with an open heart and open mind. I think that's one of the uh, fascinating things about the historiography around this war because the, there's a very different version that's, that's um, believed right now in Vietnam. And what you just shared, it reminded me of when um, I was living in Hanoi uh, 10 years ago, and I brought a copy of Journey from the Fall, right, which is about the um, Vietnamese uh, boat people uh, re-education camp experience, and I showed it to about 30 Vietnamese um, in, my, uh, in my house in Hanoi, and when the movie ended, they just, their mouths were hanging open, and they were just, that didn't happen. Right. Right. I don't know that story. And that was just 10 years ago. So it's really fascinating to see all of these different, um, again, multiple truths. So I'm going to uh, end with this one last question, where because um, we got three cards. Um, in your opinion, T, what were uh, the America's real reason for being in Vietnam? Multiple truths. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, um, the US president, Dwight, D. Eisenhower, what I talked about, you know, the, the rise of communism and the idea that like if, if one country fell, like many countries around it would fall to like the rising tide of communism. And um, the, the West had like, you know, economic reasons to want to keep those markets open to it. Like this is all, this is all documented. So I, I don't, you know, I mean, I think like the real reason is, is like it's recorded, and then the reasons that we're told is something about freedom and stuff. So we just have to read, right? <laughs> and pay attention to history. Thank you. So um, with that, let's just give a huge round of applause for T and for the, the actors, world premiere. Can we just, you were part of a world premiere.